Welcome to an unboxing video from theplayersaid.com. I'm Grant. Today, I uh, actually, I just received this this week and I'm really excited. As you know, I enjoyed immensely the Wars of Marcus Aurelius uh, that came out in, I think it was late 2018. I didn't get around to playing it until 2019, but really, really enjoyed that game, which is also a solitaire uh, game designed by Robert Dulesky and printed by Hollenspiel. So this game is called Stilico, Last of the Romans. It uses the same engine, which is a modified States of Siege, but it's not quite the same. It is a card-driven game, uses cards to activate the barbarians who are attacking uh, Rome. Stilico and his forces are trying to subject and defeat all three of the barbarian armies or enemies that are attacking. And it's a very challenging game. Historically, Stilico only made it to about round three, so you got to do at least better than that. The Wars of Marcus Aurelius was extremely challenging, but I really liked that. I, I think I played the game 12 or 13 times, and I only won about four. I started winning near the end because I kind of figured out some of the more strategic elements and how I was supposed to do things, but really looking forward to this game. This game is a change on that system. They add some new elements like the surge mechanics a little bit different. And I think the enemies, the two major differences are that surge mechanic, which I'll talk about quickly. And the enemies just are tougher. Uh, they have higher average values. They have attack values. They have higher average uh, demoralized values. So the game really is very, very different. I think it's the same, but it's different if that makes any sense. So let's go ahead and take a look at it. Very simple but evocative cover. Really like uh, uh, the, the way they they do the art and stuff at Hollenspiel. Really enjoy it. Uh, the game doesn't come with a whole lot. It's a smaller game. Let's go ahead and open that. And you can see over here in the corner, I've got the map to the Wars of Marcus Aurelius out because I want to show you just a little bit of the differences. So when you open the game, you can see, first thing you can see is there are two decks of cards. I'll dive into these really quickly. One of these is the Roman deck. So right here you can see Roman deck. The, the other one is the enemy deck. And the game is card driven. So what's gonna happen, let's go ahead and take that sleeve off. Each round, the Romans are gonna, based on the turn, they're going to draw a certain number of cards. I think the first turn and or first round in every turn you draw like five cards, then you only draw three cards the second time, and I think you draw one card the last time. But these cards are used in card-driven game fashion. You can use them by discarding it. So let's say you just don't really want this card. You might discard this to the discard pile, and you're going to do things like put down a garrison. In Wars of Marcus Aurelius, you would build a fort. But this one you're gonna, you know, put out a garrison or uh, attack a, a, an enemy stack. But here, let's just take a look at this card. Uh, it says concessions advance Olympius one space to prevent one enemy from surrendering during an oathbreaker unsurrendering. I'm sorry, during an oathbreaker check. So a very powerful card. So what you're basically do before I go ahead and jump any more into the cards. What you're basically doing there will be three. Uh, tracks and those enemies are attacking, advancing upon you. If they ever get into Rome and then win a battle, I believe uh, the game is over. They can siege certain cities. You can set up garrisons that will slow them down. But what happens is you have to get each of the three to surrender. And once you've gotten them surrendered, they have the opportunity to do what's called an Oathbreaker check. Certain cards will activate them if they can make a certain roll which is in essence a role greater than the forces that you have arrayed against them to kind of keep them in pacification. So a card like that is going to say, you know, you can move up this Olympias, which is another track you're worried about losing on. Very similar to the last game, you also had a track that you could automatically lose if it got to a certain level. But this is going to uh, prevent them from unsurrendering or joining the battle again. So that's an example of that card. Uh, remove up to two unrest or revolts. Those are just the different things that happen throughout the game. There also are, as you see, there are icons here. These icons really differentiate the cards. You can see on the bottom that says late war. 
So this card, Hun Mercenaries, is not, is not going to be in the initial starting deck. That's going to be put aside and will be added at a certain turn. So the deck will change as the battle uh, kind of progresses. Um, here's another card, Battle of Verona. The Goths retreat, retreat one space. That's simply one of the enemies that is attacking you. This event may not be used if there is a mutiny on that front or if a temporary truce with the Goths is in effect. So you're going to use these different cards in that way. You're going to use them for the events or you're going to discard them to take certain actions. So those are those are the Roman Roman cards. And the art on these is really much, much different than previously. I don't know if this is just borrowed art. It kind of looks like that. I'm sure they got the license and did it, did it the right way. Doesn't appear to be original art, but maybe it is. I, I don't know that I'm I'm sure about that. So let's go ahead and grab the enemy deck and just give you a look at that. And these are really nice cards. They don't just have nice art. And, and I really like this picture. This is obviously the Vandals and the Goths or, or the Alans getting into Rome and then tearing, basically tearing down the statues of the Roman Empire uh, as they defeat them. But here's a look at that enemy deck. And there is some changes to the way the enemy deck works. Once again, there's a designation for a late war card that's going to be added later on. Let me look for one of the cards. So here is the Vandals. So when this card is pulled from the deck, it's simply going to activate the Vandals. This like drawing of a head means that it's going to activate. So it's going to move one space. If that then puts it into contact with you or someone else or something, it's going to attack, do a siege. The other thing that's new in this game, the three uh, tracks actually cross and occasionally, either through retreating or advancing, those three different tracks can end up fighting each other. They'll come against each other, and it might result, it will result in a battle, and then whoever loses that must retreat. I think they get demoralized as well, which is flipping the counter over, and it makes it easier to defeat it later on. The other thing that's different about this, you'll notice in the bottom right side is the text surge. In the other card game, Wars of Marcus Aurelius, that this is based on, a surge would just cause an activation of all three tracks after you had to play this these cards uh, and you ended up playing a third one. It would cause what was called a surge and all three of the enemies would activate at once, move and or attack, do whatever whatever they would do. So in this game, they put events. They make it a little more diabolical, a little more difficult. Not only are the units potentially going to activate, but then they throw in these events. Let's read this one. This says, in the diocese, this enemy occupies, and the diocese is simply the, uh, the track, add unrest or flip unrest to revolt. If Galatia, activate army instead. So you're going to get another kind of not not benefit but you're going to get another happening that's going to make the game much much more difficult for you the, the barbarians you know they just have those kinds of they they surge they activate they move down the track and you're going to have to so here's an example of an event add an unrest to gallia or flip from unrest to revolt i, I haven't read through all the rules i can't remember what the difference between unrest and revolt is but those are bad things so these have different different happenings they activate the units so you can see there's and then there's Constantine which is one of your enemies as well coming from I think it's from the Britannia track uh, coming down there's some Vandals the Goths uh, and those are the activation ones so that's the way the card game works uh, you draw cards you use them to do your actions and then you draw the enemy deck cards each turn and I think each turn you draw three of those and activate their abilities and see what happens the game comes with with two dice they're both red what I have done I've actually bought additional dice and I need to find a blue one but I'll, I'll, I'll take one of the red ones out and I'll put in say a blue die just so when I'm rolling them in combat I know oh, the red is me the Romans the blue die is is the barbarians. These are the dice that I bought for um, Marcus Aurelius. So they came with I think it was two blue die, two dice blue that were blue, and I bought these because I wanted to to have them separate. So I'll put those 
uh, away here in a moment. So here's the counter sheet. It's just a half counter sheet. You can see there's about 30 counters, give or take. Uh, these counter represent your comitatentis. Sorry, just a fancy word for legions. And then these are your generals. So here's Stilico. You can see that Stilico has a combat value of two. Um, the other, Ceres and Constantiantis, he has a split one. So against one of the tracks, he has a two. One of the others, he's only a one. Uh, you can have, you see you have game marker turns there. And then you have the different counters for the enemies. Constantine the third, the Goths, and then these are the Vandals. Then you have those unrest markers. Olympias is a, an, he, I, I basically he's a senator, I think, that has favor with the current emperor, and his goal is to try to discredit Stilico at every turn. So when things go poorly, when battles are lost, or you roll a one on an attack with a legion or a comitatentis with um, Stilico, he's going to move up on the track. He's going to gain more favor in the ear of the emperor, and if it ever gets to the end of the track, you're going to lose the game. These are counters that are used uh, when certain events are played that cannot attack. As with Wars of Marcus Aurelius, you would put that on top of, I think it was the middle track, um, and it just says the player cannot attack this unit until it activates. They don't want to set up a situation where you get lucky draw. It doesn't get activated. You draw the three or four cards that you need to run up there, punch the most difficult track or enemy in the mouth, and, and kind of put them out of the game. Uh, they have do, do have a reverse side here, so you can see just some different uh, back sides. So remember I had mentioned, let me go back to this side. Remember I'd mentioned the higher average values for combat. So here's a look at the Goths. You see that they're a six and a five, and then you flip it over, which remember when you defeat an army sometimes, if you play an event or an event might come up and it'll say they're demoralized and you flip them over to their demoralized side, you can see that the six goes down to a five and the five goes down to a four. In the other game, I think the highest value was maybe a four and they would typically get cut in half when they were demoralized so they'd go to something like a two maybe even a one so that's why this game is such more such more dif uh, difficult on the player you just have better combat values that you have to come up against and i'm sure that they've compensated with some uh, additional cards that will make your combat values better let's go ahead and pull out the rule book um, and there's a couple really cool and nice components. Rule book is nice. It is, looks like it's 16 pages. And then the player aid is actually printed on the back. I have not liked that in these games. I, I know it's expensive to go ahead and add another page and maybe pretty it up or make it cardboard. I typically will take this, make a video copy of it. I'll lay this out because I don't want to be having to dive into the rule book to look at something and then have the player aid on the back and have to continually flip back and forth. So I just print it off, uh, put it out to the side. So here you can see the enemy card icons. The three at the top are just straight up activations. Embolden is where you flip them from their demoralized side back to their higher value side. And then you can see those other, a reshuffle event, a retreat, and an Olympias. So those are different too, kind of a little caricature style art of those different leaders and, and enemies, which I think is nice. Uh, but here's a look at the player card. And what I would say, this game is not difficult. You're, you're going to read through this book. You're going to know the rules. Generally, you're going to go into it, play it once or twice. And then more often than not, you don't have to refer back to it. You could generally get through by just reviewing the sequence of play. So I'll go ahead and show you the rule book. The text is fairly dense, but they do have some examples. Like there's an example in yellow. Uh, they have those throughout. You can kind of see that. Fairly, you know, fairly dense text. Uh, they do have good pictures, though, and good examples. So that's going to help you uh, learn the game. I've read through this rule book already. I've watched a couple of videos. And with my experience with the Wars of Marcus Aurelius, I believe I can get into this one pretty quick. I just need to make sure I have 
an understanding of the nuances and, and the slight differences in the system. They also have at the back, the final three or four pages is nothing more than designer notes, as well as history, which I always like. One of the things I enjoy about playing war games is the historical nature of them and learning what happened in history. There's the designer notes. And then you've got kind of a listing of all the different cards and ex explanations of who those people or events are. If that's your thing, Holland Spiel always does a, a good job of that, and I think they've, they've done that again. So there's the rule. So as you can see, there's only about 12 pages of rules. The rest really is the designer notes, enemy card notes, and Roman card notes. So here's an improved... Uh, component that I want to show you in the previous game. Let me just pull out the map here. In the previous game printed on the map, you had these displays right here that were where the played barbarian cards would go and then when when a card would say surge. So you might play barbarian card one and it has a, it says put it in the discard pile or it might say add to the surge pile. So if it was add to the surge pile, you would move it down to surge one. At the time when a card played that is associated with a surge gets to the third, then a surge happens. So that's kind of the way they dealt with that in the previous game. Let me go ahead and, and leave that. Here, this is a canvas style, very nice canvas style component where you're gonna lay the, you're gonna have the enemy draw deck here you're gonna have the enemy discard pile and then those same spaces, those surge spaces there at the bottom, and then those barbarian card played or drawn enemy cards at the top. That just keeps you, it's like a mnemonic device where you draw a card, you put it in that, you draw the second card, oh, did I draw two cards or three already? You look at this and you see, oh, I still have a card to draw. So that helped me keep me straight in the first game and they add this really nice canvas uh, component with a great art on the background. Very well done. I really like that. I like that much better, frankly, than what they did in the first game. Part of the reason I think that they did this, this map is like twice the size of the one from Marcus, the Wars of Marcus Aurelius. But that's the canvas uh, card drawn, enemy card deck holder, whatever you want to call it. Now let's go ahead and take a look at this game map. It is a paper map. I think you can buy a, a canvas map upgrade. I have never played with one of their canvas map upgrades. I've seen them, held them. They are amazingly detailed and very, very nice. But here's a look at the Stilico map. And you can see it's really pretty. It's also larger. Uh, this map is literally twice the size of the previous game. But you can see the different tracks. So the Goths, here I'm pointing, are the green track. They're gonna move down towards Rome. Uh, the Constantine III is the purple track. So you can see he's moving down through Gallia uh, and then comes into Rome through the north and, and then comes down the, the peninsula. And you can see at a couple of points, let me go ahead and pull that up just to show you that there are a couple points where those, those tracks intersect. So here's the Constantine track and the Goths track, and they cross here. They go different ways, but you can see they have a point here where they might actually encounter each other, which is a good thing for you because then, then they kind of fight each other and you don't have to necessarily uh, fight with them so much. Here is the Vandals track. You can see right here, sorry, I was covering that up. That comes down and it also crosses with the Britannia track, but it goes to Hispania through Galatia, Aquitania, and goes into Hispania and ends in Galatia. So that's a look at that map. There are different boxes. Here's the turn track up here at the top. Here is the round track where it's going to remind you, let's go ahead and fold that up. And I wanna talk a little bit about the art and the graphical design on this. So here's the round tracks, and it's going to remind you, hey, you draw three enemy cards. You'll notice that's every round. And then the Romans in the first round draw five. Second round, the Romans draw three. And the third, the Romans only draw one. You do not have to play all of the cards that you draw. I think you can carry over a certain amount. Um, 
So you might carry one or two over each round because having cards is like a resource. If you have cards, you can do a couple different things. You might be able to discard a card to stop an effect from happening. I know during a battle, you can do what's called reserves where you can discard a card to add one to a combat roll. You can actually discard two or three cards if you had them to add plus two or plus three. So that will mean you'll win a battle sometimes when you were, were going to lose. So you don't have to play all those cards. That's a look at that. Let's go ahead and go to the other side of the map. You can see here, There's this, this is the Olympias track. Um, you can see it has one, two, three, six, eight spaces. And if it gets to the very top, Olympias wins. He has discredited Stilico and Stilico will be beheaded and executed. Also, if you'll notice, uh, there's some notes here. I was looking at these, just different things that you're gonna be reminded of as you're playing the game. I actually like there that the Vandals track, which is that yellow track, it says each time Vandals are activated while in Galatia, so those last, that last space, um, you're gonna add unrest in this order. And I think you probably can't unto, add two unrest in one space. So it's going to be Hispania, Septum Province, Gallia, Italia, uh, Anorea, and Suburbicaria, the suburbs and the um, capital. But just good to have those effects there on the board. It just reminds you. But I, I did want to lay that map out. And it's just, it's beautiful. I mean, the map layout and design is so great. And then I wanted to show, so get a look at that. Once again, both of these maps are great. They're just different. So here I'm going to throw in the Wars of Marcus Aurelius. And it is just this left-hand side. I'm trying to center that so you can kind of get a better look at it. Much plainer, although this is really nice. I like the clear uh, words used. I feel like the graphics are very clear with the bonuses for terrain, the different Imperium track elements that you find on the on the map itself on the tracks but comparing it to the new one with Stilico there, there really isn't a comparison to me this is much more professionally done they've spent some money in art and layout which I think is very very good you can see that they've adorned the edges with the different in essence the different shields of the various barbarian tribes that you might have seen as well as the Roman troops that goes around I think the colors are better they're there's some uh, relief, subtle relief on the map here with some, some light mountains you can see, some forests that you can kind of see in the Germanic area. Just in my opinion, a much improved, much upgraded, better graphically designed map. Doesn't mean that the Wars of Marcus Aurelius is bad, but it, in my opinion, doesn't, doesn't really uh, compare. So that's kind of a look at all the components here. Typically what I do is try to try to lay these out so you can get a look at them. Um, I don't know. These, this game to me is absolutely amazing. I have enjoyed my 12 or 13 plays of uh, the Wars of Marcus Aurelius. I enjoyed it because it, it's a solo game one. You can play at your own pace. It was fairly short. It was like seven or eight turns. This one, it looks like it is 10 turns. Yeah, 10. Sorry, I was just trying to... It says 10 right there. You know, this is a game that you're going to enjoy over and over and over again. I think it plays in about an hour, hour and 15 minutes. I think once you get the, get the rules down, it's going to play much, much quicker. Um, but yeah, this is a great game. And... One quick word on Robert Dulesky. I think this is his second or third game that he's designed. Wars of Marcus Aurelius was another one that I played. But, man, he's really good. I've enjoyed the way he's done this. I think he's added in a lot of great elements to the game. I hope that he continues to design. I think he has a, a fascination with the Roman period. I think there's a lot of stories like this that would fit this system very well. And I think he could probably also go to other cultures and other civilizations and use these same elements there. There is an attraction for Rome. Uh, I, I know I've played a lot of Roman games and really enjoy them, but this is a really great game. I'm unboxing it so you can see the components. This is now available from Hollenspiel. I think the price is $50. 
It is a print-on-demand model. It takes around a week. Once you order and pay for the game, typically a week for Blue Panther, who is the printer, to print it, package it, and send it. I think they're located in California. So if you live on the West Coast, you might get it in five days. Uh, typically, I've gotten them anywhere from three to seven days. Just depends on uh, the load. Um, but yeah, these games are great. If you know anything about Hollenspiel, you know they are not necessarily a focused wargaming company. They do all types of games. We played Dinosaur Table Battles the other day, but we also played the table battle system that is historically focused. So they do a lot of different types of, of games. I've enjoyed their, you know, their war games. This is a war game, but it's not necessarily a traditional war game, not Hex Encounter. Uh, there are counters, but it's not Hex Encounter. So if you haven't tried Hollenspiel, give them a give them a shot. They have a lot of games. I think they have 50. This is the number 52nd game, number 52, Hex number 52, they call it. So there's 52 different choices. I think we own, between Alexander and I, probably 20. Um, really have enjoyed them. If you're looking for other solo games in this system or line, The Wars of Marcus Aurelius is very good. There's also Agricola, which focuses on the Roman subjugation and control of, of Britain. Um, and then Charlemagne, which uses a totally different system. Agricola and Charlemagne use totally different system, but they're great little solo games. I own and have played both of them. You know I've done written content on Agricola. I've played Charlemagne three or four times and won once. So that's also a very challenging game. Uh, but I'll be doing some written content on that. I want to get this played this weekend so that I can start formulating my thoughts and strategy. And then I want to... Uh, write about this one and also do a video review. So thanks for watching. Uh, appreciate it. I've been Grant for the Player's Aid, and you can find a lot of other content, videos done by me. Alexander, I think, does a better job unboxing. He likes to do it more. Uh, he probably does 75 or 80 percent of our unboxings. Um, but I was excited, got this one, and wanted to share it with you. So thanks for staying, sticking around with me. This has been Stilico, Last of the Romans from Hollenspiel, and uh, I'll I'll uh, hopefully do more videos on it coming up. Thank you for watching.